Elise Gattari was a French analyst, semiologist, and militant organizer, best known for his work with the philosopher Gilles Deleuze. He wrote four extremely dense works of experimental theory, produced ten collaborative works, and there are now six posthumous collections of his essays and lectures. Involved in numerous organizations throughout his life, it was his foundational role in the Federation of Groups for Institutional Study and Research and the Organization of Solidarity and Aid to the Latin American Revolution that brought him into contact with Daniel Cohn-Bendy, Jean-Jacques Lebel, and Julian Beck, with whom he soon organized the movement of the 22nd of March, a rebellion which grew to what we now know as May 68. It is from this point that our investigation into Gattari will begin. During a 1971 conference of Lacan's Freudian School of Paris, Gattari holds an intervention, a brief but powerful critique into the traditional roles of Lacanian psychoanalyst. In this intervention, titled Money and the Analytic Exchange, we find Gattari critical of the acceptance of money in the relation of an analyst to an analysand. He claims there is no service provided. Both the analyst and the analysand have different modes of working, which are of equal importance and value. And instead, he proposes that the analyst and the analysand should both earn money. He declares, when the psychoanalyst is paid, he is in fact reproducing a certain process of crushing the patient to adapt him onto the personal logical poles of capitalist society. This intervention challenges our understanding of the notion of profit, the modes of production, and the analytic relationship. It helps us question the extraction of surplus value and begin to approach a notion of modes of production which are not bounded to the economy of goods, but of politics of desire. The 1973 intervention, Everybody Wants to Be a Fascist, also known as the Micropolitics of Fascism, develops the theme of a micropolitics of desire. He begins this intervention with a proclamation that you cannot speak of pleasure and revolution in the same sentence. We must seek to abolish all machines of domination independent of their pleasures. In approaching this dynamic, Gattari identifies three primary methods, an analytic formalist, a synthetic dualist, and an analytic political approach. The analytic formalist approach works by the disintegration of forces. It separates common features from one another while constructing a new species. Gattari uses the differentiation between modes of fascism and the delineation of fascism of being a pure problem of over there as an example of this approach. The synthetic dualist approach works by mediating mass forces. The existence of revolutionary desire is acknowledged, but it is limited to the existence of some predetermined mass. We move from an approach of mental representation to one of social representation. As a result, a gap between collective desire and its representation by the party is created that no dialectical synthesis can repair. The final approach is that of the analytic political. It works by a consolidation of the minoritarian forces. Collective struggles gain a consistent voice, which allows them to act with a greater strength. However, stratification has not been avoided. It is in this arrangement that Gattari locates a collective assemblage of enunciation where semiotic material and social flows all merge together. Returning to a discussion of fascism, we can use this third approach to claim that instead of there being a delineation of fascism by nation or culture, we are indeed dealing with a plethora of different fascisms in any encounter, the basis of which is the same molecular reduction of totalization. Gattari notes that the Inquisition has had its own fascist mechanisms, which have been continually deployed to this day, and will be deployed for the foreseeable future, as it is not tied to any time, place, or object. Instead, fascism is a molecular affair as much as a molar one, as any material can enter into fascist arrangements when totalized. This molecular space sets the scene for a micro-political struggle for the liberation of desire. To recite a portion of this lecture, Alongside the fascism of the concentration camps, which continue to exist in numerous countries, numerous forms of molecular fascism are developing. A slow-burning fascism in familialism, in school, in racism, in every kind of ghetto, which advantageously makes up for the crematory ovens. Everywhere the totalitarian machine is in search of proper structures, which is to say, structures capable of adapting desire to the profit economy. We must abandon once and for all the quick and easy formula, fascism will not make it again. Fascism has already made it, and continues to make it. It passes through the tightest mesh. It is in constant evolution. To the extent that it shares in a micro-political economy of desire, it's self-inseparable from the evolution of the productive forces. 
Fascism seems to come from the outside, but it finds its energy right at the heart of everyone's desire. We must stop once and for all being misled by the sinister buffooneries of those socio-democrats who are so astonished that their army, allegedly the most democratic in the world, launches without notice the worst fascist repressions. A military machine, as such, crystallizes a fascist desire, no matter what the political regime may be. Trotsky's army, Mao's army, and Castro's army have been no exceptions, which in no way detracts from their respective merits. Fascism, like desire, is scattered everywhere, in separate bits and pieces, within the whole social realm. It crystallizes in one place or another, depending on the relationships of force. It can be said of fascism that it is all-powerful and, at the same time, ridiculously weak. And whether it is the former or the latter depends on the capacity of collective arrangements, subject groups, to connect the social libido on every level with the whole range of revolutionary machines of desire. In a 1984 text with his then-student Eric Allier, Capitalistic Systems, Structures, and Processes, Gattari identifies three equal levels of capitalism. These are the processes of mechanic production, structures of social segmentarity, and dominant economic semiotic systems that lay a foundational groundwork for a complex analysis of capitalist machinery. From these, a social chemistry can start to be built. In capitalism, the segmentarity becomes materialized in the state, the semiotic in the market. From here, a general formula of the structures of capitalist valorization can be deciphered and distinguished by the relations of these three levels. In a chain which prioritizes the state then production, then the market, we get a fascist war economy. From the market to production to the state, we get commercial capitalism. When we prioritize the market, then the state, and then production, we get liberal capitalism. Production being prioritized first, then the state, then the market, brings us to colonial capitalism. When we prioritize production first, and then the market, and then the state, we get our contemporary system of integrated world capitalism. Finally, we have the situation of state capitalism, whereby the state is the priority, then the market, then production. When the market is prioritized in the first instance, equilibrium is approached through the connection of power to wealth. In commercial proto-capitalism, the notions of credit and debt were created to maneuver this relation of power without an initial referent to any state authority. In the case of crude liberalism of 19th century capitalism, the state homogenizes the working population to continue the proliferation of markets. The fascist war economy, the accumulation of capital becomes the central goal of the state and its military machine. In state capitalism, the state demands not only a market of the economy, but of prestige, innovation, and desire, which relies on authoritarian control. In neither case is stratification abandoned. With production at the forefront, colonial capitalism extracts a surplus from outside of itself. This is distinct from the fascist war economy, as the latter only seeks to accumulate the capital within predetermined boundaries it already controls. It creates a suicidal state, as opposed to the homicidal state of colonialism. Our contemporary condition is marked by integrated world capitalism, which pushes capitalist valorization both into the molecular and the molar. Here, all of society is productive in the first instance. It affirms production for production's sake, whereby permanent restructuring becomes the central process of capitalist valorization, and both the factory and the state become mobile. It is even capable of living in symbiosis with other structures of capitalist valorization. In another text published in 1984, The Left as Processual Passion, Gattari reflects on the failures of electoral politics to connect the people to collective desire. He articulates a molecular revolution, a transdisciplinary refusal to engage in molar politics, to organize new collective modes of expression. He briefly hints that processual passions, dynamics which destratify structures and reorganize life, can help push us towards new modes of being with equilibrium. The refusal of work serves as the foundation for a Gattarian politics. Referring to this dynamics, he closes the text, Everything follows from that. How to put an end to certain type of state function and to the old racist herd mentality reflexes. How to reinvent a transnational culture, a new type of social fabric, involving other cities, 
other alliances with the Third World, how to counterbalance the two-headed imperialism of the USA and the USSR, it is all there within reach, everything that could reverse the situation in a flash and dispel the shadows and the nightmare.